Hi, I'm Stephen Hevern. I'm a senior technical account manager at AWS, and I'm based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, for those that celebrate, happy Halloween. We have a frightfully good show for you today. Welcome to AWS Supports You, where AWS support experts provide tips to optimize performance in the cloud, lower costs, and provide you with best practices and design considerations. Uh, joining me today is Lox and Sukmeek from AWS Support. Uh, Sukmeet, can you give us a quick introduction? Of course. Thank you for the opportunity, Stephen. Uh, I'm Sukmeet Mara. I'm a senior technical account manager based out of the US East. Uh, I'm a specialist in machine learning, uh, predominantly in the areas of computer vision. And uh, today we'll be talking about a couple of questions related to SSM and CloudWatch. With that, uh, give it back to you, Stephen. Sure. Lax? Yeah. Uh, I'm Lax Sundarajan, a solutions architect working in the healthcare and life sciences practice. Today, we'll be talking about a couple of questions in management and governance on Health Lake. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Cool. Thanks. Today, we'll be answering your questions from AWS Repost, focusing on the topics we just talked about and more on AWS. Before we get into the details, a quick note to the attendees online. Feel free to use the chat window on the right-hand side of your screen to let us know where you're joining us from today and share your thoughts and questions throughout the episode. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. We'll also provide a link to our survey. So if you'd like to let us know how we did, please uh, click on the link uh, and leave your feedback. Uh, if you'd like to take a guess at my costume in the chat, please do. If no one gets it by the end of the episode, I'll let you know who I am. Uh, and if you want, please share your favorite horror movie in chat. Uh, Sukmeet, can you start us off? Of course. So uh, I'm going to be answering three questions today. Uh, to begin with, there's a question about you know managing or deploying different piece of software to different EC2 instances based on tags. Uh, there's a couple questions about permissions related to CloudWatch. So uh, with that out of the way, let's let's get into the first question, right? Um, the question on repost was about you know installing a specific software based on you know tags on EC2 instances, right? So the idea is, let's say there's a tag of Red Hat versus a CentOS, you know, uh, somebody wants to deploy software automatically to these instances that are tagged in a certain way, right? So um, pretty self-explanatory there. And uh, good news is I, you know, I'm going to talk about a feature that is going to make it really easy for anybody to kind of automate this software deployment. Um, before I get into the steps, I quickly wanted to touch on uh, AWS Systems Manager. I'm not going to talk about the numbers on the screen, but uh, you know, uh, the idea here, here is to kind of tell you what Systems Manager is. So in short, it's a collection of capabilities to help you manage your applications and your infrastructure that runs in AWS Cloud, right? So System Manager simplifies application and resource management. Uh, it shortens the time to detect and resolve your operational problems. And at the end of the day, it helps you manage your AWS resources securely at scale, right? Um, there's multiple ways to access Systems Manager. Uh, you could do it from the CLI, SDKs, Systems Manager console, so on and so forth. Uh, there's an agent that run, runs uh, in the back. It's called uh, Systems Manager Agent. Uh, uh, it's an Amazon software that runs on EC2 instances, edge devices, on-premises servers, and virtual machines. The SSM agent makes it possible for Systems Manager to update, manage, and configure these resources. Right, So it's really important to know that you, you should have a SSM agent running for all these tasks to be automated. So uh, one quick note here: there's a feature, that, or, or a, uh, that there's a feature that's called uh, Systems Manager Distributor. Um, you know, it helps you package and publish your software to AWS Systems Manager managed nodes. Uh, you can install the software in multiple ways, either as a one-time task or on a, on a schedule, right? And there's multiple benefits of using a distributor, right? So first benefit is, you know, one package, many platforms. So distributor supports multiple operating systems, including Windows, Ubuntu, Debian, Red Hat, so on and so forth. Uh, you could control package access across groups of managed instances. Uh, uh, you can run command or you can run state manager to control which of your managed nodes gets a package and which version of that package, right? So there's very high level granularity as well. Uh, you can run command and state manager uh, uh, capabilities on these manager nodes. And then 
on managed nodes, uh, these managed nodes can be grouped by instances or device IDs as well, right? Or different AWS account numbers, tags, regions, so on and so forth. Uh, another advantage is many AWS agent packages are included and ready to use out of the box, right? Prime examples are Amazon CloudWatch agent or, you know, AWS PV driver, so on and so forth. And last but not the least, automate deployment, right? To keep your environment current, you use state manager to schedule packages for automatic deployment on target managed nodes when those machines are first launched. So let's look at the runbook, right? Um, quick rundown of what I'm going to showcase in the next couple minutes, right? Uh, we'll be going through the AWS console to access the systems manager. Then we'll look into distributor, then deploy a package, and then do like a one-time deployment or a scheduled deployment of the package, right? With that, I'm going to bring up my demo here. And we'll go over. So in the console, click on the EC2 instance. Uh, just quickly showing you, I have a couple of instances running um, and they have different tags. So I've named them distributor one and two. One is a Red Hat instance, the other is a CentOS. And then if you see the tags here, I've got key values for, for the OS that's running on those instances. So distributor two and CentOS, right? So that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to showcase here. And then we'll look for a systems manager. And then scroll to the bottom, click on distributor. That's the feature that we want to access for node management. This is what I was talking about. There's out of the box um, packages ready for you to use in distributor. Uh, here, I'm gonna kind of you know show you third party packages, right? And then our goal is to create a package. So I'm gonna name it, you know, PowerShell SSM, right? Uh, and then I'm gonna select a PowerShell distributor uh, bucket name and then um, add a prefix. And then this is the important part. I'm gonna upload a couple of softwares that fit well for each instance set. So now I've selected a software for PowerShell for Red Hat and I'll have another piece of software for CentOS. But here I'm just trying to show you the, up, the script. And then next up, the CentOS software, I'll select the CentOS OS. And then if you look at the script, it'll kind of show you like the installation steps. So once we are through, we'll see all three greens here. Just take a minute. It's usually pretty fast, but all right, there we go. We click on continue. And then our package is ready, right? Um, so you'll see the status uh, pretty soon. But this is where you'll probably add permissions. You'll select the way you want to deploy the package. So now our package is, you know, it, it's active. A permission is where you would, you know, kind of share this package across accounts or keep it private, right? So it makes it easy for you to share it across. You could add tags if you'd like. And then here, uh, just for the sake of today's demo, we'll be, you know, do a one-time install. Once you do that, you've got plenty of options here, right? You can install, update, and reinstall, you know, uh, or you can put an update in place, right? And then this is the important step. We want to target specific instance tags, right? So I'll say, hey, Red Hat instance tag, and then up next, I'll do like a CentOS instance tag. And once that's through, um, the SSM agent will know which instances have these tags. You could have rate control as well. Let's say I wanna have this across um, 20 targets and then my failure threshold is 10% of that. So you can set your own parameters and you can have an SNS notification as well. With that, uh, this will get deployed to, to the instances that match the tags. All right, I will come back to my screen here and you know uh, we'll get to the second question here. This was a question about CloudWatch access, right? Uh, uh, what it means is the user access to only a specific group of CloudWatch logs. Uh, we'll see how we tackle this, but the ask here is you know kind of giving access to a user to only a specific set of group of CloudWatch logs. 
So a couple of ways for doing that. First one is, you know, allow access to one log group. Um, as you can see in the policy here, I've uh, put in the resource uh, for the CloudWatch group. It's called sample log group. Uh, the important thing to note here is if you see towards the end of the resource, there's a colon and a star uh, at the end of the log group in the resource line, right? Uh, it's, it indicates that it, the policy applies to all log streams inside that log group. So if you omit the colon and star, uh, the policy will not be enforced. So that's that's a quick tip for everybody on the call. Uh, second way of doing that is using tagging and IAM policies. So you can grant user access to certain log groups while preventing them from accessing other log groups. Right. So to do so, you tag your log groups and use your IAM policies that refer to those tags. So when you tag log groups, you can grant an IAM policy to a user to access only the log group with a particular tag. So for example, in this policy, in the following statement, uh, it grants access to only log groups with the value of green for the tag key team, right? So there's green and the tag key is team. So the user will only get access to that particular policies or that particular logs, sorry about that. Moving on, there was another question about, you know, uh, the user wanted to kind of get more details about a Windows Server metrics like the memory utilized or memory available, disk space util, you know, disk space used, so on and so forth. So there's a quick way of doing it, right? Uh, the prerequisites for doing this is, you know, you should have an EC2 instance uh, running, Windows, or, uh, sorry, running Windows on a public subnet or a private subnet. You need to have an IAM role. You need to have an SSM agent running and a CloudWatch agent. So RDP into the instance, install the CloudWatch agent. You could do this either with the SSM document or cloud. You could download the package manually. So let's say we go with the manual route, right? Um, you would invoke the web URI for that and then install your um, CloudWatch package and use the wizard to run through that. Once you follow the steps in the wizard, uh, you can also configure the CloudWatch agent config file for other windows performance counter so here i'm just giving an example of you know i'm setting a counter name as percentage usage percentage free space right and i'm putting in a formula and this gets me the information at every 30 second level right i'm also looking at the processor logical disk memory etc right? so you can set your own counters and uh, you'll see the link as well to the full page document so the idea is to follow the wizard put the file you know you can find the cloudwatch agent file in a certain location on the screen right and then you copy that to a different location in the configs folder once you have that, you start your CloudWatch agent and, you know, open the CloudWatch console. And then from the navigation pane under metrics, you can choose all metrics. And then you can also sort by like image ID, instance ID, so on and so forth. Right. So pretty straightforward, self-explanatory. And then there should be links in the chat as well for the team to look at. With that, I'll hand it back to Stephen. Great, thanks for that, uh, Sukhmeek. Next up, uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. As a reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to, free to put them in the chat on the right-hand side. Uh, and also uh, share your favorite horror movie or take a guess at what my costume is today. Uh, let's bring on Lax to uh, tackle the next set of questions. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. So today I'm going to talk about a uh, couple of questions in the health lake area. So the questions that I'm going to tackle are, the first one is about how do I get started with health lake? Uh, where can I find more information? And more importantly, how do I get data in and out of health lake into S3? Uh, the second one, which you're going to talk, talk about is what happened to my health lake? Uh, it just doesn't show up. So we'll handle both these questions. But before I get into the details of these questions, let me just talk about what health lake is, what does it do? And then we'll, uh, get into the answers. So what is Health Lake? Health Lake is a hip eligible service to make sense of health data. So what does it do? Like it has three key benefits. The first one is Health Lake uh, transforms data seamlessly. That is it automatically understands and extracts meaningful medical information from raw data such as prescriptions, procedures, and diagnosis. 
Second, it identifies the trends and make predictions because Health Lake presents a chronological order of medical events so that you can look at trends like disease progression over time and it kind of enables healthcare organizations to improve care by intervening earlier. Third, it supports interoperable standards like FHIR, uh, which ensures that the health data is shared in a consistent, compatible manner. So how does it actually work? So you have the structured and unstructured data in a FHIR or a format, and you can bring that into Health Lake. You can leverage a number of connectors published in the marketplace by our partners. And once you bring in the data, uh, you can kind of take a look at it, search the data, query the data, visualize it using QuickSight, um, use SageMaker to run predictions on the data and integrate that with third-party applications. So what does it mean by extracting meaning from health data? So let's look at uh, this uh, medical note. It basically talks about a patient with type 2 diabetes and it basically talks about uh, previous history and when was the admission date and so on. So this is pretty much unstructured clinical note. And what Health Lake does is it can parse through this unstructured clinical note and create structured data like what you see on the right side. And it can give you confidence scores for each of those nodes based on its NLP capabilities. This is pretty important because you're trying to put structure to the medical data, which will help you in organizing the data and kind of treating the patient better. Let us look at uh, some more example about ontology mapping, which is actually another key feature where you can extract all the features like ICD-10 codes, Rx norms, and you can map it to the appropriate codes. Again, just continuing on our previous example, if you look at it, the note will say something like metmorphin 1000 mg tablet uh, in the morning. This is a clinical note. But what HealthLake can do is it can look it up to the corresponding Rx, and it also can say this is a confidence score, and then it can tell you like how much is it going to cost. So basically it's able to tie unstructured information into something that it can make sense. So with that said, uh, the question is, how does it all fit together? So what you can do is you can pull up all the structured health data to see a complete view of a patient's medical history in chronological order. And how does it actually help? Because if you look at it uh, in today's world, when a patient goes to a provider, uh, you're going to have medical history across all sorts of uh, notes. And to put it together, to make sense of it, it's going to take a really long time. Instead, if I have a way to look at disease progression over time, it gives healthcare organizations new tools to improve care and intervene earlier. And it also helps them to have a complete view of a structured data and make better clinical decisions. So in, the, in short, what are the use cases for HealthLake? So HealthLake offers hospitals key analytics and machine learning tools to improve efficiencies. Uh, it helps organizations to analyze uh, population trends uh, with machine learning and analytics tools like QuickSight. Uh, it helps improve quality of care and reduce cost by bringing together patients' complete medical history. And finally, Health Lake enables clinical decision support systems to store and evaluate clinical data to deliver uh, dashboards, which can let you measure compliance as well. So AWS has a bunch of HIPAA eligible services, uh, which basically leverage machine learning. Uh, some of them are shown here. Health Lake, Comprehend, Medical, Transcribe Medical Recognition, and SageMaker. Put together, these services can improve the quality of care by unlocking the potential of healthcare data. And to get started on Health Lake, you can go into the product documentation page. Uh, there is also a workshop that's present in the page, which will give you a pretty good overview of how to get started with Health Lake. Uh, with that said, let's get into the question, which talks about how do I get data from Health Lake and how do I export it? So here, if you look at the demo, I'm actually going into my account. And if you look at it, this is my health lake. And you can see on the top, health lake is available only in three regions, US East 1, US East 2, and US West. It's not available in all the regions. And if you look at health lake, you have data stores. 
So I'm going on view data stores. This is my data store that I currently have. And I can actually click on create data store if I want to create a new data store. I give in my name. And if you look at it, there's a checkbox that tells me preload sample data using file or full format. So if I don't have any data, if I just want to play around with sample data, I can check that box. And the encryption I can choose, either I can bring in my own key or I can use AWS product key. And I can say create data store. That goes through creating a new data store for Health Lake. And let's say the data store is created. Uh, you can see it's file R4 format. If you go in, you can see there are four buttons on the top, delete, run query, import, and export. So let's look at run query. That's basically lets you query the data store uh, with the current data. So I'm just going to do a search. I'm going to choose the patient data structure. And I am going to actually query for gender equals male. And then I'm going to run the query. The result is shown on the bottom. And if I scroll through, I can see that the gender actually male. So it pulled all the records that matched my query. I can add more conditions uh, by saying add new search parameter and it will accordingly give me the newly updated results. Let's talk about how do I get the data out? So the export lets me get the data out. I need to click on a specific S3 bucket where I want to export the data. So I pick the S3 bucket. I want to actually pick a key because it's healthcare data, I want it encrypted. So I pick a key and then I have to pick a role which has access to this key and the bucket. And the moment I say export data, it is going to take this data from Health Lake and export it onto S3. And I can just copy the job ID. I can run a CLI command. That will tell me the status of how long it's going to take. Once it's completed, I go into the S3 bucket and I can navigate to the patient schema. It's uh, exported a JSON file. I can download it and take a look at it. That's my healthcare data. So that's how you kind of get data in and out of Health Lake, and you can query it on the, the data that is already there. And the second question is about my Health Lake disappeared. Uh, the Health Lake is available only in three regions. So make sure that you are in the right region, then you should be able to see your Health Lake. So that pretty much answers the questions on management governance and Health Lake. With that said, I will hand it over to Stephen again. Thank you. Thanks, Lox. Um, we don't have any questions in chat. Uh, as a reminder, go ahead. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in chat. And again, to guess at what my costume is today. Um, thanks, Lox, for that. Moving on, uh, we have a couple questions now uh, that I'm going to take. Uh, we have a question about API retirement and getting more information on those notifications. Uh, this leads us to AWS Health Dashboard. So let's jump into a walkthrough. So I know I saw a notification or I got something about an API retirement, a deprecation, something that's end of life. How do I find out uh, the information that I need to know to take action on that notification? Uh, you enter health in the console and um, open up the uh, navigate to AWS uh, health dashboard. Uh, in here, you can see uh, within your account, not just the service health, overall service health of AWS at large at the top with open and recent issues and the service history, uh, but you can look at your account and see the notifications and um, open issues, schedule changes, uh, or even go in here uh, to the event log uh, to take a look to find previous notifications uh, to see and find more information about uh, whatever service notification you might be looking for. So you select event log under your account uh, and as you can see here, this shows you the history, which we maintain for 90 days, uh, of all of the different uh, notifications and issues uh, and events uh, that have occurred related to your account. So let's click on event category. Let's uh, select the notifications and see if we can't find what we were looking for. If I come in here uh, and filter it down, we can see, oh, right, there's the SageMaker operational issue uh, that we were looking for. Uh, and as we can see here in the details, um, there's details about it, but there's also affected resources. So when you're looking at it to, from your account perspective, you can see uh, what uh, resources may specifically be impacted by this event. And as we scroll down, we give you a description, 
details, including the dates when we're talking about uh, service changes uh, that you need to be aware of, as well as uh, a whole lot of information, links to other information to help you be able to take action if you need to, um, to either change the, the service that you're using or make configuration changes uh, as it relates to the notification that we're sending out. Details, a lot of, a lot of information here. So uh, if you have a lot of information, uh, if you have organizations enabled, excuse me, um, you can go under organizational health. And as you can see here uh, in the event log, now you're seeing the events and event history. Again, let's take a look for uh, notifications there. And this is looking across all of the accounts um, that you have uh, within your, um, let's see, jumping around here. There we go. So uh, all of the notifications which you might have gotten across all of the accounts that are associated to your organization. So let's go back in here, filter again, and let's take a look at that in detail. And as you can see, as it comes up, there's more information um, related to um, all of these different accounts. So there's a lot more notifications here than when we had searched previously. So let's take a look at this uh, RDS operational notification. Uh, and as you can see in here, we've got um, a notification here that's about um, Aurora MySQL uh, and the 5.6 compatibility reaching end of life. So we have that information there uh, that allows you to, again, quickly find that information that you're looking for. So those are two different ways that you can go around to get to that uh, information. And the other piece that we have, uh, and again, there's different services. So we can come in here, let's take a look at a uh, specific AWS service. Let's say we're not looking for a notification, but we wanna see everything that's kind of impacted a service at a, uh, a particular time or that history. So let's go down and um, I think there might've been a, an issue with Route 53 or something that happened. And I wanna take a look at that service and see what that history tells me as it relates to my account within my organization. So we'll select Route 53, make that selection. And as we can see, well, there was one issue recently. Um, let's take a look at it. And within that, you can see with the uh, operational issues, it shows you the timeline of everything that's been happening as well as you can see here, uh, if there was other services impacted or affected by the issue that was going on by that event, uh, we detail that out here so you can see that. Um, and then the, again, the timeline there to be able to see what all you have in there and if there's anything affected uh, within your account that we see or that could be affected, we'll list that out here. And it doesn't seem to be that there was anything with this particular uh, set of accounts. So the other thing that you can do is uh, Besides going into the console here, we have the uh, Amazon Health Aware uh, solution that allows you to go in and configure this mm -hmm. so that you can take these notifications, whether they're issues, events, or uh, uh, something else, to be able to integrate them to whatever communication method, whatever um, services that you leverage, um, such as uh, Slack, Teams, uh, or tie it into event bridge so that you can then take an act and uh, take some actions on those notifications or to integrate it into other operational services or ticketing systems to raise those alerts to the teams um, so that they can uh, take appropriate action when these things come across. Uh, and with that, let's jump back into another question. This time, um, we have a question about uh, submitting requests to increase service quotas uh, to address when you encounter a service limit exceeded. Uh, so let's uh, jump into a demo. Again, coming into the console, uh, let's uh, do a search for service quotas, click on that, and that takes you over to the service quota screen in the console. Um, so let's take a look specifically at uh, SageMaker and uh, the quotas related to that service. As you can see, there are um, quite a lot of uh, quotas up 
related to SageMaker. As you can see here, uh, there's an applied quota value, uh, default value, and adjust and whether or not it's adjustable. So the applied value is the current quota value that you have uh, for that uh, particular service quota in your account. The default quota value is the value um, that AWS applies to the account when it's first created. And adjustable is whether or not you can put in a request to make an adjustment to that service quota limit. Um, so what that means is uh, why would we show you or why would we uh, advertise uh, quotas and limits that are not adjustable per se? That gives you the ability to see and understand that if you're being impacted by a service limit, or if um, you're running into some sort of limit, you can understand what those limits are and generally be able to take uh, action to either re-architect or make changes to your workload so that you're not running into those limits, but it's still then visible to you uh, within the service quota console. As you can see here, a couple examples here um, are for some processing and training jobs. You know, the first one's 432,000 seconds, which is 120 hours, or the 2.5 million seconds, which is around a 720 hours. Uh, it's quite a long lot, uh, long time for those uh, jobs to be running. Um, so let's put in and talk about putting in a service request. So we're going to put in, and let's see, a uh, request for a specific machine type. And I think we're going to look at the C5 uh, extra large, find it in here. And put that in. And the um, when you're putting in these requests, there we go. Um, let's request the quota increase. Um, so here you'll see a summary, of what the quota is, its description, what the utilization is, uh, values. So let's put in um, 410 and make that request. You can also uh, do this via API calls or via the command line uh, to be able to make these requests. And you can also um, query and find out what the quota values are, or what the settings are uh, as well through those methods. As you can see here, you've got the request that's in here. Um, it takes a little bit of time for it to be processed. Uh, depending on what the type of request is, it may go as a, a case to us and uh, a support engineer may come back with uh, some more uh, questions or clarifications around that limit increase or around that request, depending on the size or the amount that you're requesting that for. Uh, a lot of the times is you want to be able to make sure, especially when you're looking at SageMaker, there's a lot of different uh, things that you can change or increase in terms of the quotas. So you want to make sure that you're getting, we want to make sure that you're getting the right uh, quota settings and that you're getting, if there's something else that you may want to increase alongside of this quota request, we want to make sure that that's getting in there as well so that you don't hit uh, another limit. So that's going to take a little bit of time to be processed. Once it's processed, then that quota becomes available to you um, with, within your account. Uh, and as you can see here, this is the details of what you see in the request. And let's go in and take another quick look at uh, some of those uh, quota values in more detail. Again, going back to the X5, X large, the C5, X large, excuse me. And as you can see in here, there's a lot more details. One of the nice things you have about this is you can see what's been requested on this before. I've got that request that's in here recently. And um, we can also see the monitoring for the utilization. How much are you getting close to or hitting that service limit? You can also see this um, within CloudWatch uh, and also your trusted advisor checks will uh, make you aware of these things also. And then um, the, some of these are um, region-based quotas or 
they um, for global quotas, like something like AWS Global Accelerator. That's a global quota that applies over the entire account. It's not region specific, um, but a lot of other ones are region specific. So if you have multiple regions that you're going through this with, you want to make sure you're looking at the right region uh, and selecting increases in the regions uh, that you want to look at. Finally, one more thing, again, like the last question, if you have AWS organizations enabled, you can come in here and turn on uh, quota request templates. Uh, this is a nice feature, very easy to enable. We're gonna come in here and enable it. And once it's enabled, we can go in and add a quota. What this will allow you to do is select, let's take a look, Virginia, uh, let's take a look at VPCs and uh, I think we're going to take a look at, what is it? NAT gateways. Yeah. Internet gateways, excuse me. We'll pick internet gateways. And what's the desired quota value? Let's say 10. We're going to double it from its default. So I can come in and add this uh, service quota template. And that means that anytime I stand up a new account, AWS account that's associated to this organization, it's going to go ahead and make these uh, quota requests on my behalf for that account. Um, so that, that way, if you're spinning up a lot of accounts, you know, I have a certain set of configurations, a certain set of things that I need from my workloads that I'm deploying to these accounts, then you can put these in as uh, request templates. Some of these, um, you can are limited to, I think, 10 quota increases here. Um, so you want to be judicious about what you're selecting to kind of automatically uh, spin that up. But it's a good way to be able to tie this to an account and not have to like code anything or write any automation uh, for you to be able to go ahead and uh, make that change. Uh, and as I mentioned, you can, um, the other last thing that we have, we'll put a link to it in the chat, is we have a service quota solution. This implements, uh, which implements reporting, monitoring, alerting on service quotas, so you can raise notifications and alerts from trusted advisor, um, so that you can uh, take action when you're getting closer, or when you're looking at um, where you need to be on your limits and what you can raise. And with that, let's come back in. Taking a look, uh, I don't see any other uh, questions in the chat. Um, if not, then I think we have time for a bonus question. So I have a quick bonus question here. One more that we're going to go into. Um, can I register multiple physical keys uh, for root MFA? Uh, you can only have one uh, physical root MFA device um, on the root account. And the same is true for IAM users as well. They can only have one MFA device um, on their account. Um, root is needed really only Root access is, is really only needed in an account um, for a very limited number of uh, activities that you would need. So changing account level permissions, restoring an IAM administrator's permissions, activate IAM access to billing and cost management, change, closing your AWS account, registering as a seller, uh, and, a, and a few other actions. Um, so most everything that you want to do or need to be able to do on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis can be done with IAM users. So having uh, limit the access to root, securely store that physical MFA device, uh, and having a process in place to break glass when you need uh, root access is, is one of the recommendations that we have or best practices that we have. If you're concerned about um, losing or destroying the root MFA, uh, the, the physical device that's a, a MFA device that's assigned to a root account. Um, we do have a process sharing the link there in what you can go through in order to um, kind of recover or change out that physical device with a new one. Uh, we do have a process for that. Um, the alternative also would be to leverage a virtual MFA device. And that's gonna give you different options in terms of uh, backup restoration, uh, for those for that MFA device and those keys that you can also uh, manage yourself for alternative recovery actions. Um, and with that, uh, let me see, is there anything else? Yeah, so I think that's that's kind of the way it is. Um, you know, it's, I, you know, I understand the question could be around 
hey, I want to have multiple physical devices just in case something happens. Uh, but we do have processes for that. And again, if you want a little different flexibility, you can always go to a virtual MFA device. So with that, let's uh, bring back in Lox and Sukmi. Awesome. So let's see, are there any closing uh, questions or comments? All right, cool. Lox and Sukmi, thank you very much for taking the time today to answer some of our questions from uh, AWS Repost. Um, uh, today we covered questions on CloudWatch Health Lake, Systems Manager, Health Dashboard, and more. Uh, if there's any questions that weren't answered today, you can post your questions on repost.aws, where one of our experts can provide you with uh, an answer to your uh, uh, with an answer, or your question could become uh, a topic for one of our future shows. Uh, if you have feedback for us, please check the chat box on the right for a link to our survey, and you can email us at aws supports you at amazon.com. We do want to hear from you. Tell us what else would you like to see on this show? Uh, please join us next Monday, November 7th uh, at 11 a.m. Pacific time. We'll be implementing infrastructure as code using Python. Uh, and for those that uh, haven't guessed, uh, my costume uh, for this Halloween uh, has been uh, Kimi Raikkonen, a uh, F1 world champion uh, racer, uh, also known as the Iceman. So... Thank you for joining us uh, at AWS Supports You. Happy cloud computing and happy Halloween. Have a spectacular Halloween, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, all. Have